Okay, good evening. Uh, as you know, we're having the lecture here every Monday between 8.30 and 10. 10 o'clock I have to leave, so it has to be precise. Uh, today I saw a very interesting uh, article that uh, in the state of Texas, you know, this is uh, one of the states that are very, very strict with their judgments over there. They also have executions. They already released 41 criminals from jail since they started to double check their cases from D with DNA. And one of them is a person who was 31 years in prison for not committing a murder. 31 years a person was sitting in jail and he did not commit the murder. Now you may come and say, where is the justice? Who knows what he did? You know, when the, when the government wanted to put Al Capone in jail for murders, and he made many murders, they couldn't find. So in the end, they put him in for taxes. <laughs> as long as he's behind bars, right? The Torah doesn't have this kind of system. A person is guilty of one sin, you cannot attach to him a different scene just because you want him in jail or, or, or killed. It doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, according to the Torah, if a person was mechal el Shabbos while he was stealing on Shabbat, let's say he went, there was an alarm there, so he disabled the alarm and he stole and he made violation of Chilul Shabbat, and this is on already after he got a warning that he's not allowed to use electric on Shabbat. If Bet HaMikdash, we would have Bet HaMikdash in our days, if today Bet HaMikdash would be here, and they have the Sanhedrin that would sit in Lishkata Gazin, the 71 judges, and they would know a case like this with witnesses after he got the warning, so he cannot claim, he didn't know that to violate Shabbat is illegal, he, didn't, he cannot claim. So now he's guilty of two sins. One is Chilul Shabbat, and one is stealing from that business, whatever it was, right? He went in and he robbed the store. So let's say he robbed, I don't know, a million dollars there. What you would think may be the punishment he deserved to get, he has to return what he stole, as the Torah says, he has to pay double. And for the Chilul Shabbat, he has to be executed. Because the Torah says, Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat. Comes the Torah and say, no. There's a rule, it's called Kimle Bederaba Mine. When a person made uh, two sins at the same time, he gets punished for the war sin. But the other one is, getting, is left, left alone. Which means, in a case like this, they execute him, and they don't take money from him. It's very interesting. One time I saw a beautiful uh, question, sad case, but beautiful question, of a person who drove on Shabbat and hit someone's car. Some, some car was parking, a person drove, he wasn't careful, he hit the car, and he made $10,000 damage to the car. And two witnesses saw him, two religious people on the way back from shul, they saw him, they know the guy. Now remember, all the things that I'm talking about is according to the justice of the Torah. Today, unfortunately, not necessarily we can bring people to justice uh, because we don't have the court according to the ways of the Torah. They don't sit in Yerushalayim, there's no Bet HaMikdash, there's no executions. Uh, you know, there's many differences between the time of the Gemara to today. But the reason I tell you that is because we have to know what God thinks about us or about our friends. If he doesn't kill us today, it doesn't mean we are not guilty. So we have to know where we stand. And based on telling you these stories, and thousands of people later when they watch these scenarios, many of them send me emails that are very surprised. You want to tell me that I, every day of my life, I'm guilty of the, or I deserve an execution? Is that because I do this on Shabbat? I heard in your lecture, some people are so ignorant, they have no idea. They get very shocked when they get this, when they hear it. And my job is to try to wake up people as, as much as possible. So I saw a case that a person hit a car, and two witnesses saw him. If we had Bet HaMikdash today, he wouldn't have to pay for the damage he made in a car. Why? Because they're executing him for being Mechalel Shabbat. So because of that, however, 
What happened if it's a person from the kibbutz? He grew up in some kibbutz. He never heard in his life the word Shabbat. Or he grew up in Russia, I don't know, some kind of village in Russia. He never heard religion in his life. And he not pay for damage. And so now, in that case, he's not guilty of execution. It's called Tinok Shenishba. A baby that was captured by the Goim. It doesn't mean literally that the Goim took him when he was one day old and put him in prison or took him away to the church and uh, he grew up like a Goy. That's a classic scenario. The kid grew up like a Goy and has no idea what Shabbat is. Somebody like this is not guilty of any Jewish sins that he committed. Why? Because he has no idea what Judaism is. However, he's guilty of not believing in one God not searching for the truth of that God, not being grateful to this God. If he's worshipping an idol, then he's guilty, because for that you don't need to be religious. You know, if you put a, made a statue and you bow down to the statue, then, you know, you're a person that deserves a punishment, even if you never learned Judaism in your whole life. This is common sense. <coughs> and you should not steal. You don't need the Torah for that. It's common sense. You steal, you're a bad man. You cheat, you're a bad man. You're a cheater that cheat on your wife, you're a bad person. You know, you have no values. Now, values you don't get in college, especially if you're in the United States. Over there, they won't teach you to become a human being. It's a little bit too late for that. One person came to the Chafetz Chaim, and he asked the Chafetz Chaim, hey, Rabbi, uh, my wife and I just got married. And we had just a baby, you know, so Baruch Hashem, right away we had a baby. And I come to you right away to ask you from what age I should really start educating this boy. From what age? Because right now he's a baby. So he told him 20 years ago. Which means before you want to raise a, child, a child, you first have to educate yourself. If you don't have values, how are you going to come and tell your son you, sh you should not steal? He see you stealing in a business every day. You're bragging about it to your friend, no? When you play cards on Shabbat with the cigarettes like this, gambling on money, you can teach him to become a Shomer Shabbat. You send him to yeshiva to relax your conscience a little bit, to make your wife happy. The yeshiva won't help him when he sees his father is like this. <laughs> he goes to work. He goes to shul and from there he drives to work. Well, who are you fooling? You know, so the idea is that first you have to make yourself a human being. Many of our parents, they're facing a horrible situation with their children today when the children are in their 20s and they go and marry Goim. And most secular Jews, it bothers them that their children marry Goim. Not all, not all. Some people are bragging about it. For instance, uh, the, the father of the, of the boy that married uh, Clinton's daughter, I don't think he's depressed over it. If I would be his father, uh, I would choke myself from sorrow. I don't care that she's the daughter of the ex-president. Who cares? When we say every morning, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Shelo Asani Goy, bless you God that didn't made me a, did not make me a Gentile. We are not talking about the murderers in Texas that are waiting for execution, that they went and raped and robbed and killed innocent people, or people that are standing bombs on the street, you know, and they're begging for a quarter. That's not what we, when we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, bless you God, I didn't make me a goy, that's not the going you should have in mind. You should have Obama, you should have uh, uh, Michael Jordan, you should have the, the best rock and roll singers, all these fake, phony symbols that everyone wants to be like them, this is what you should say, thank you God for not making me him. Thank you for not making me that movie star. Thank you for not making me the President of the United States. Thank you for not making me an Arab sheikh that lives in a hundred billion dollar house. That's what you have to aim. Because all of them together are not equal to your nail. To your, to, your, to your nail from your smallest finger, all of them together. Why? Because no, nowhere in the Torah God called them his children, all of them together with all their wealth. Each one of us is a son of God. How much the Christian praised one son of God, which in the end he wasn't even a son of God, <laughs> according to the, to the story. But in case he was, 
they have to worship each one of us. We also son of God. Well, at least we have a receipt to back it up where the Torah that they believe in. What does the Torah say? That Hashem said to every Jew, you are my children. I chose you from all the nation to be mine. With their story, they claim that he's the son of God because they come and make up a story that Mary, Maria, Miriam, she, you know, she got pregnant by God himself, which is a ridiculous claim because God is not uh, committing adultery. He doesn't come to a married woman after he warned us in the Torah so many times, stay away from a married woman, never dare to touch her finger. It's the worst sin in the Torah. If a person go with a married woman, it's, a worse than, it's worse than a murder. It's a worse sin than a murder and a worse punishment from a murderer. Why would God, after warning us so much, respect, respect the, married, the marriage institution, respect the marriage couple, don't break their marriage. If their marriage has crisis, it's a big mitzvah to make peace between them, and then he's going to come to a married woman and make her pregnant. <laughs> so that's kind of nonsense. But here you go. Two billion people buy that nonsense. But we know for sure that it's all baloney, you know. But the idea is that nobody can deny what the Torah says, and they believe in the Torah 100%. You see, the Christians know that they call it the Old Testament. But the Jews... The Jews didn't realize yet, most of them, that they are the children of God. Most of the Jews don't realize yet. They don't understand what does it mean to be a son of God. So I started to tell you that the court system in the United States and in Israel, I don't know where it's worse. Could be here it's worse, could be over there it's worse. Very hard to answer this question because there's millions of cases and you have to compare them. Uh, you know, so it's, it's very difficult to know where it's worse. But I can tell you one thing. Today they released a, a black prisoner after 31 years that he was in prison. They blamed him for murdering. And now the DNA proved that he's not the murderer. Now you have to understand, the good thing about them is that they kept all the DNAs from 30, 40 years ago when there was no way really to tell in those days, but today they go and check one case after the other, so they release 41 people from prison, which they're sitting innocent, supposedly, on a crime that they supposedly committed, and now they found out that they're not. Also in Israel, there was a very famous case of a person who supposedly raped and murdered a soldier female, which happened to be my babysitter when I was a baby, it was the most ca famous case in the court in history ever. That uh, for, she disappeared, nobody knew where she is, and they took a person named Amos Baranes, they put him for 20 years in prison, and in the end it was proven that it wasn't the murderer. For 20 years he was screaming, I'm not the one, I'm not the one. But a year ago they released him. Uh, you know, his life basically was already destroyed. Also that black guy that they released today, his life is now 51 years old. From 20 to 51, he was sitting in prison, and he never committed a crime. Now, why the, the secular justice system, why it's the most dangerous things to society? Why is it? Let's start with what the Torah says. The Torah says that a person that doesn't have Torah values cannot be a judge and cannot be a witness. You cannot rely on one word of testimony from him if he comes to testify in court. Why? If a person violates Shabbat, knowing that the Torah said that it's a covenant between us and God for eternity, that a, per a Jew that doesn't keep Shabbat is equal 100% like a goy. He has no share to the world to come. He has all the restrictions of God against him every second of his life. If a person doesn't care about that, he doesn't care about his own body. He doesn't care about his own soul. You can rely on him to testify on a person, on an innocent person. How can you rely on him? He doesn't care about his own life. He cares about somebody else's life. He can say anything he wants for money, for ego, for honor, to save himself. Here comes the main problem. Do you know how today they find people guilty in a court? Most of the cases and there were few murderers going together to murder. One turned against his friend, and they used him as a witness. He tells them supposedly what took place. They release him, 
or they give him a very, very easy punishment, and then they, they make him disappear. They give him a new ID, they send him away, and nobody knows where he is. That's how it works. This is, it's, you know, it's called, this is Avel Shezo, Ek Lashamayim. This is uh, outrageous. This is uh, every righteous person have to stand in the street and scream for this nonsense. Who are these witnesses? This is a murderer. This is a murderer that went there to, to murder a woman or a man just last night and he got caught. Of course he's going to say anything he can to release himself. Whatever, he's gonna, whatever he wants he's going to say. If he was the one who actually shot, he's going to say those two are did it and I was waiting outside. And I'm willing to testify. The first one who come to sell himself to the FBI or to the police, they buy him. And this is what happened right after. From that moment on, they send people to prison and nobody ever knows if really they did it. It's based on a testimony of one witness, one witness that everybody knows, including the judges, that is the last person that you want to rely on. The last one. And it's not only here, it's in Europe, and it's in Israel. Now comes the second problem. I want to show you the damage in a society without Torah. The second problem is that the judge himself is not an honest person. He also doesn't care about himself. He doesn't care about his children. He doesn't raise them according to God. He may come and say, I believe in God, but he can care less on any word in God's Torah. So if he's ignoring God, if he's ungrateful to God, how can you rely on him to do justice? If a person doesn't care about himself, he cares about his victims over there, people who stand in court, he doesn't care. He sleep very well at night. He sends him to prison for the rest of his life. It doesn't bother him. But according to the Torah, if there's 1% doubt, you cannot convict a person. If there's any doubt, there's one contradiction between the witnesses even if they answer 999 questions the same, one question they answer differently, you must let him go. Based on what the Torah says, 99% of the people who sit in prison, according to the Torah, they couldn't go there. And there's another way to look at that. Many people who get two, three years in prison, according to the Torah, they deserve execution. Or the other way. Some people that, according to the Torah, they're completely innocent. They go to the United States to many years in prison. For instance, somebody told you some information about a company that their stock will go up next week, and you bought stocks, and you made some money. You can go to prison six, five, uh, six, seven, ten years, depend on how, many, how much money you made, and they take away everything you have, your house, your bank accounts. They leave you with nothing. You, you build yourself in 20 years, one transaction you made, it's called inside information, right away they destroy you. They take away everything. They finish your life, your marriage, your children become bums overnight, they take away your cars. Even a rapist doesn't get such a punishment, which is worse than a murderer. He sits six, seven years in prison and comes out after good behavior. Four or five years later, you see him walking back in the street. Hard to believe what's going on here. So here comes, here, here where the, the foundation of the problems, you know, this is happening every day, every day, you see. The police investigation, the people who work for the police, they are, most of the time, they are not honest people. They have pressure the, from the authorities, the commanders that is in charge of them, the chief of police, that he puts strong pressure according to the government needs according to the police needs, according to the opinion of the people, to convict quickly a person. Knowing is not the one, they don't care. Nobody has irat shamayim. As long as the public will remove their pressure from the case. And the worst thing I ever heard in my life is, it's when they convict a person or not, when they decide which case to go, two people committed the same crime. One they go after, the other one they don't. Why? When you ask them why, they say, in this case, the public have no interest. But in this case, the public have interest. Why? This is a movie star, and this is just a shoemaker. Well, nobody cares about him. But this is a juicy case. We put all our efforts in this case. Plus, they lead the witness that they just made a deal with. They lead him to say what they want him to say. 
Because they already want to put this guy in jail and nothing will help him before the trial even begins. Do you understand what's going on here? You, I'm telling you if Eliyahu and Navi would come for one minute and would give us a list of how many innocent people are sitting in jails, you won't believe what's going on. And how many murderers and pedophiles are walking around us every day. You have no idea what's going on here. Now I give you another case that I heard, unfortunately. I don't want to give too much details because some of these people, you know, you know, maybe you know them, maybe you heard about them. Today, the FBI are hunting pe innocent people and turn them into criminals. What's the, what's, was, what was the FBI made for? The police, the FBI, to serve the people, to protect society, to convict criminals, to catch the murderers, to put them behind bars, or to, or to bring them to court. What do they do? They sit on the internet and they try to find people who make scenes through the internet with, with the teenage, with young people that are not 18 years old. Boys, girls. Everybody understands that this is an emergency mission. It's very, very dangerous. There's more and more sick people in our society. If a person grew up like a monster without Torah in public school when all his friends walk with guns and knives, what do you expect him to become? Is a danger to society. This public school c create millions of monsters every year all over the world. Not only here, everywhere. If there is no God, it's better. It's better to bring any religion to the secular schools, even fake religions, than to keep it secular. Even knowing Christianity is nonsense, knowing Islam is nonsense. It's better to turn the school to religious according to Islam or to Christianity or any other cult than to keep it secular. Why? Because when a person has fear from God, it doesn't matter which God is fearing, but he's fearing a superpower, his chance that he will turn into a dangerous monster is much lower. Well, when a person has no fear from any God, you never know what to expect from him. So now this is what they do. They sit on the internet, and they pretend that they are kids. And they, and they go back and forth. Now they know the IP of the computer. And they know, oh, this guy is a, is a pedophile. I told him I'm 12 years old. This is an FBI agent. He's pretending he's a girl. So he's going back and forth. Some of these pedophiles eventually come to the meeting. They make a date. When they come to the meeting, they catch them, and the rest, you know, it's court and all the rest. Some never come. It was just, you know, making a temporary scene. Then they realize, what am I doing? It's not me. So they quit right away. Who deserves a bigger punishment? A person that was caught coming to rape a little girl, and they caught him right there coming with a gift or something to look for her, and then in the end they found that there was a trap, or someone who never came, made tshuva before he came. He had an opportunity. She invited him, supposedly, and he didn't go. So leave me alone. Don't contact me anymore. Who deserves more years in prison? Someone who came. Someone who came, right? Now I have news for you. I know of a case. Eleven people they hunted like this. All of them came to the, to the date, except one, a Jew, that never went. All the other people got probation. Not one of them went to jail. They cut a deal with them. One, two, three, finished. And the one who is now they're asking for more than 10 years in prison is the guy who never showed up and never made a scene in the end. Where is the justice here? And I'm, no, I'm talking to you from knowing the details of the case. Where is the justice? How can we rely on the police here, on the FBI, on the court? What's going on here? You understand? Now I tell you another example. Now all these things I'm telling you, God forbid, I hope you never need this information, but it can happen to people around you any minute that we're talking about. One other problem is that sometimes the people have a good profession. They went to college, they have a license, doctor, lawyer, I don't, architect. And by being convicted in a court with a felony, there's a high chance that they lose their license, which means the seven, eight years they went to college and all the reputation they built themselves is gone. One day, you know, so now what happens? Sometimes they tell you, okay, we won't put you in prison. You sign that you're guilty. 
will recommend to the judge to give you three months of uh, service, volunteering in a hospital, uh, being a, a, a guard in a school, something very minor, but as long as it's in your record. Now, these people, they don't want to take the deal. Why? They don't trust Hashem to send the money. They think that they're making money thanks to their license. They don't understand it's nonsense. Many people went to the best colleges and didn't find any job, and people who hardly know how to write their name in English, they're making millions. If God wants you to make, you make. He doesn't want you to make, you don't make. So what happened? They said, no, we don't want the deal. Why? We want to go to court. Why? Because we don't want to lose our license. And guess what happened? When they go to court, then they get 20 years in prison. What sent them over there? They never learned rule number one in Judaism, Emunah in Hashem. Isn't it a heart-ripping case to hear such a thing? Person that they offer him, okay, you can go. You can go home. That's it. Tomorrow you go back to your children. But we put it in your file that you're convicted uh, criminal. You know, for, for years you have it in your record. And you may, you may, there's no guarantee. Maybe they keep it, maybe they don't. Maybe you lose your job. You compare losing your job to ruining your life? Ah, so many cases like this you see, and it's, it's horrible what's going on out there. And you see, the Torah warned from all these things. Avraham Avinu went to Mitzrayim, he told his wife Sarah, say that you are my sister, don't say you're my wife. If they know you are my wife, they'll kill me right away. Why? Because a married woman, even the Goim knew, and at least in those days, nobody dared to touch a married woman. People today, they lost completely their values. But in the old days, even the murderers have some values. They rather kill Avraham before they touch his wife. Why? She's a widow. Widow is permitted. You understand? So the, the idea is, if I'm going to take a Jewish married woman, I must get rid of her husband first. Ah, murderer, it's, it's a violation from the Ten Commandments. Still, no problem. Married woman, for me, is much worse, the Egyptians say. So Abraham say when they caught him, when they found out it's not the case, they asked him, tell me, why did you lie? So he say, Amarti, I, I understood, she'en irat elokim b'makom hazeh ve'araguni. In this place, you have no fear from the real God here. And it's just a matter of time until you kill me. You have no fear to kill a person. So i rather saying that she's my sister. We can argue if it was the right decision or not, because I don't know what's worse, that they'll take his wife, and who knows what happened, thinking she's his sister, or that they'll kill him. Sometimes I'm not sure what's worse. I know many religious people that if you give them two options, one is to get killed, and not to see that somebody has to shalom do something bad with their wife, or one is to say life and to see that another some kind of psycho kidnapped his wife. He would rather get killed than knowing that somebody kidnapped his wife and put her somewhere. Just from the thought, I would drop dead. If it's normal. If it's normal. One thing I want to tell you, you know, in Ukraine, every minute... A woman is kidnapped for prostitution and sent to Turkey, to Europe, to Israel, to the United States. Did you know that? Yeah. Married women with children. They see her somewhere. They're offering her a job. They take her to the place. They put her in a van. The next thing, they smuggle her from the, from the border. And her husband and the kids never see her. And now if you want to buy her back, forget it, what you have to go through. If you locate her, most of the time you never see where she is. They lock them in a room for 20 years like horses. They give them some bread and water. They don't see daylight. That's what's happening in this cool world. And this is all because people have no fear from God. That's it. All the crimes, if you really pay attention, what's the root of every crime? Stealing, cheating, lying, murdering, raping, violence, this. What's the, what's, where does it come from? God is not around. Do you know one murderer that would, 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 would shoot the bullet knowing that God is watching him right now? Let's say he was able to see God. Let's say. Would, would his hand move? God is watching him. He's about to kill a person. He, he would freeze for a year. He wouldn't be able to move. Why is shooting? Because in his mind, God doesn't see what. 
That's what's happening. And that's what happens when people lose their countries. You know, if you know me for years, I've been talking about there, are, there is two ways of making people religious. And I'm talking now based on my opinion, but now I'm going to, Baruch Hashem, I found something very interesting to back me up for something that I've already been saying for years. There is one way which is productive, and one way, in my opinion, is grinding water. You know what does it mean to grind water? 20 years you grind water. What do you have after 20 years? Same water, no? You did not achieve anything. You go like this, 20 years, in the end you have water. So there are two ways to make a person religious. One way is, and I'm saying, one way is really very productive, and one way is almost have no success at all. It's all baloney and lights and fooling the public that supposedly you are, but in, in reality you do nothing. If a person only show the beauty of the Torah, in his lectures, in his books, in his videos, whatever he does, only the beauty, to love God, to be praised, to praise him for his beautiful creation, to be impressed from the beautiful creation, to see all kinds of beautiful things that God does in the world, what he did for the Jewish nation, to speak about the reward, only positive. That's very good, no? Jews begin to love Hashem. Oh, we have such a great God and we didn't know who he is. But once you leave them alone, two, three days later, what normally happens to these people? They go back to be exactly how they used to be. Once in a while, you find a very high soul, a person that his soul is in a very high level. It's enough that one hour he hear beautiful things from the Torah, and he's running after the truth. He doesn't need you anymore. Even now you beg him not to become religious, it's too late. He saw the truth, right away the next thing is in a, in a bookstore. Give me some Jews, Jewish books for beginners. Give me calling the rabbi, sending emails, almost harassing the speaker, just to give him more and more information. Where can I learn about this? Where can I learn? This is, you know, one, one in a thousand maybe you have a person like this. One in, I'm talking from 15 years experience. One in a thousand you have people like this that their soul is like an atomic bomb. They heard 15 minutes of words of Torah, wow. How come I didn't know about this? How can nobody say this? How can, uh, the next thing, oh, you cannot stop them anymore. Six months later, he's a rabbi already. No, this kind of people, there's not that much to do. You don't need to talk to them about punishments. It's not necessary, I agree. But the, the other 999, if you only talk about beautiful things, you're grinding water. You do nothing. You have to do a combination, combination of showing them the beautiful side of the Torah and all the positive things. But at the same time, you tell them life is not a picnic. There is a heavy price to pay for your lifestyle, my friend. Just that you didn't get punished yet doesn't mean your file is not huge from all your sins, and you owe a lot. Your credit card debt is growing by the minute. Wake up before you miss the train. If you don't do it, I'm telling you, most of the energy that you do, it's a waste of time. Now, in case you don't agree with me, now I'm gonna give you two proofs that this is the only way to do it. Listen good. Rashi brings an example from the Torah. What does Rashi say? Rashi says, Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, God spoke to Moses, Achare mot bnei Aaron, after the death of the sons of Aaron. Hashem comes to speak to Moshe after his two nephews died. They were holy people, the two sons of Aaron. I'm not talking uh, people from the neighborhood here, you know? So this is two holy people. They made, I don't know if you can even call it a sin, something that wasn't proper, and they pay with their, with their life. According to their level, there was a strict judgment. So, so Rashi asks, why the Torah wasted few words here? We know that the Torah never writes a word for no reason. Every word in the Torah is calculated many, many times if it's necessary or not. If not, God makes the Torah as short as possible. Why does the Torah have to say that he spoke to him, Achare mot bnei Aaron? We already know that it was after. 
Why does it have to say, Acharei mot bnei Aaron, four extra words in the Torah? And Rashi brings an analogy. You know, Rashi was writing in a very, very, very short way. Very difficult sometimes to understand Rashi. It's very, very short. His grandson, the Rashbam, when Rashi passed away, the Rashbam had to continue from where Rashi was translating the Talmud. What the Rashi used to say in five, six words, the Rambam say in 50 words. Same thing, in 50 words. There are places like this in the Talmud. They explain the same verse in the Talmud, one over here, one over there, Rashi, five words, Rashbam, 50 words. That's already a, a new generation, 30, 40 years. Rashi is one in, a, one in a million years, you have one like him. A special place, person. So, all of a sudden, Rashi decided to tell us a story. And he writes, this is what he writes, Mashal, analogy, Mashal le rofe. A person goes to a doctor, and he says, doctor, I'm sick. And the doctor says, don't go to a cold place and a humid place because it's not good for your health. Let's say a person has a problem with his lung, his coughing, whatever the case may be. So the doctor said, don't go to that place where you want to go. Why? It's humid and cold over there. Breathing that air, it's not good for your health. Don't go. And that was the end of the doctor's appointment. 300 bucks for five words that the doctor say. That's how it usually goes. Then Rashi brings another case. He went to a doctor, and the doctor told him the same exact things, but he said one more sentence. Don't go to that place that it's called and humid, that you won't die like that person who went there last. And Rashi writes, who affected the patient positively? The first doctor who only told him don't do it because it's not proper, or the second one who added an example, a warning, because if you're going to do it, that's what's going to happen to you. Rashi said the first doctor did nothing. The second doctor woke him up. Not always. Sometimes you tell him anything, he won't wake up. You're not an angel. It's up to him if he wants to wake up or not. The second doctor touches his heart, his conscious. Oh, oh, if I go, that's what's going to happen to me. I better watch out. That's one example. Then you heard about the Chafetz Chaim? Chafetz Chaim? Chafetz Chaim, I saw in some of the books that he was born in a wrong generation. His level was so high that if he would be born 2,000 years ago in the time of the Tanaim, he would still be considered a tzaddik. This is who we're talking here about. Chafetz Chaim. Not only that all the Lashon Hara Alachot is clarified for the whole world, not only was a holy Kohen tzaddik that never made a sin in his life, he translated the whole Shulchan Aruch, the Mishnah Brura, it's also Chafetz Chaim, as a legendary person. It's not just another great rabbi. We had, Baruch Hashem, thousands of great rabbis. But everybody knows Chafetz Chaim deserves a chair on the VIP on the stage with the most important figures we ever had. Everybody knows. There's no argument about this. Chafetz Chaim, this is what he wrote. One time, he made a committee. He, used to, he lived in Radin, and he invited all the rabbis from the towns and the cities around Radis. Remember, there was days that you only had trains, so 100 years ago. He passed away, I think, about 80 years ago. So he invited all the rabbis to a convention. And what did he say in his speech? The Chafetz Chaim say, this is what he says. He says like this. I want to read word by word, if I find it. If not, I'm going to tell you by heart. It says like this. When a person go today to lectures in our time, Chafetz Chaim writes, if in his time he say it, today it's a million times needless to say. Because in his generation, the people were much, much higher level than us. Much, much higher level. So the Chafetz Chaim wrote like this. He said, in the old ways, the old days, the door of the Rishonim, a few hundred years ago, 
when a speaker used to come and give a lecture to the public, most of the lecture would be around one topic. I give you one guess. This is the words of Hafez Chaim, word by word. One topic almost all the lecture used to be on. Heaven and hell. That's what 99% of the subjects that used to talk, all the biggest rabbis in history, every lecture, that's all they talked about. Why, why did they come to give a lecture? To wake up the people to understand where they're standing. If I'm standing as a doctor in front of my patients and I don't tell them how serious is their situation, I'm on the border of becoming a criminal. Seeing a person drowning in a lake and not jumping to help him, yes, you're not a murderer, but you're not that far from him. If you see someone drowning and you can jump and save him and you worry about your $100 suit, what words we have to describe who you are? What? what you have a dig you have dignity? You have life value? You're a good person? Can you say one positive thing about yourself? What, what's your excuse going to be when you stand in front of God and you say, didn't you see that Jew is drowning over there? You walk like this and you whistle, you're walking your dog and you see someone is drowning and you don't care. So the Hafez Chaim wrote, and those darshanim, those lecturers, their lecture were very helpful and very positive to the nation of Israel because they brought them closer to Hashem. Today, this is at least eight years ago. I don't know at what part of his life he said that lecture. It could be eight years ago, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, about 100 years ago. <coughs> Today, not only the, the speakers are not helping anything in their lectures, the Hafez Chaim say, they're making a serious damage to the public. When I say that, who am I to say it? Yeah, people say it's crazy, it's fanatic, no problem. When I saw this Hafez Chaim, I almost jumped from the window. Finally, I have something to wave with. Hafez Chaim, with me, you can argue, you can say whatever I say, it's nonsense, no problem. You can make a point. Nobody can argue with the Hafez Chaim. Nobody. How many people are greater than Hafez Chaim? Today, for sure, nobody in the world. There's nothing even to talk about. And even in his time, nobody was in his level. The Hafez Chaim say not only they're not bringing them closer to Hashem, if they don't talk about reward and punishment, heaven and hell, they're making a damage. What's the damage? Sitting an hour or two in front of an audience and not shake their conscience real good, making them a tremendous damage. You know why? It would be better off that he wouldn't come to that Torah lecture to hear a few jokes and two or three nice stories. Why? This guy lives with Christine in his house. This guy is stealing. This guy is raping. This guy is Michal El Shabbos. This guy is this. This guy all day Lashon Hara. He comes, he sits, he laughs. He enjoys beautiful things. He goes home without any conscious problem. He doesn't say to him, hey, you're about to marry this Goya and destroy your eternity. No, he doesn't hear it. <laughs> Michal El Shabbos in Shulchan Aruch is 100% like a Goy. Nobody tells him that. When he dies, he will scream to this lecturer, you, it's all your fault. I came 20 times to your lecture. You know I live with a Goya. You know my children are going in a house and you never told me once to wake up. You made me feel good about myself. Not only that, you invited me to Lela Seder to your house with Christine. Yes, and you don't say a word. And there's another wedding tomorrow with Christine. And tonight there's probably another hundred, and tomorrow another fifty, and the nation of Israel disappearing. And nobody makes a beep about it. And when you ask these speakers, why don't you ever talk about punishment? Half of the Torah is punishments, half it's rewards, but there's also another half to the Torah. Why don't you waive the punishment for the people to realize, my friend, there's a price to pay. You're going to pay the price. Don't you want to save yourself? Who wants to accumulate punishments? Who? Show me one person normal that knowing that what he does every minute of his life, one day he's going to have to pay and it's going to be very painful. You know one person? Unless he is a, is a, what do you call it, sadistic? 
Not sadistic. A person like to torture himself. Masochist. Yeah. That's only the, so in that case, it's a mental case. He may be not obligated to keep mitzvot if he likes to suffer. But this is it. So now, I tell you what their answer is. We're afraid to turn them off. Who agree with this answer? It's true, though. That's what the rabbi said, that they're scared of the job. What they, what they say, I already know. I hear it for 15 years. But I'm asking you, if you agree with this answer, no. do you think this answer is true, or is just a lousy excuse? What do you think? It's a lousy excuse. Yeah, Why not very good. No, I want, I want to know, imagine there's a doctor who his wife asks him, how come all your patients in the last 10 years, whatever they have, you give them to Advil and you send them home? So he answered to her, Miriam, darling, my heart doesn't let me give them bad news. I'm afraid to turn them off. She said, but you know, that guy died from cancer, that guy died from heart attack. That guy did this, that guy did that, that guy has kidney, this guy he lost his liver. Maybe if you tell them their situation in the beginning, it wouldn't happen to them. No, no, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid. It's not, it's not my style. I like to only talk about nice things. Ah, now you're laughing. Now who's more important, a doctor or a rabbi? I'm a rabbi. Of course a rabbi. Why? A doctor can save you for maximum 60, 70 years. He, he can add to your life if he cure you. If you're 10 years old, you're about to die, and the doctor cure you, so he gave you 60, 70 years of your life. <laughs> right? But if the rabbi cure your neshama, he gave you trillions of years of life in the greatest place that you can imagine. It's nothing to compare. If you don't believe me, I'll read to you Alachain Shulchan Aruch. A person that found his rabbi's wallet and his father's wallet, who does he have to run to return first? Rabbi. Why? If his rabbi is in prison or his father is in prison, who does he have to release first if he has only money for one of them? Rabbi. His rabbi. Why? His father brought him to this temporary life. And his rabbi brings him to eternal life. There's nothing to compare. You understand? If he has a rabbi that really teaches him the right things. What if the father is also a rabbi? Huh? What if the father is a rabbi? Then his father, of course, has two titles. It's two against one. You know, it reminds me about a good, <laughs> a good joke. One, one rabbi, he came to give a lecture. And uh, he sits by the microphone. For 20 minutes, he doesn't make a beep. So they say, Rabbi, what's the problem? I said, I didn't bring my teeth. Forgot my teeth in the house, in a glass. Can't talk like this without teeth. It's hard. So where is, what's the address? So he wrote the address. So they send one guy around quickly to get his teeth. So the guy comes with the glass. The teeth are inside. The rabbi turned around. He put the teeth in. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. He begins to talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Four hours already. Then the Gabai see, oh, soon the alarm will go off, automatically. You cannot, we get locked in the shul. He comes to him, Rabbi, usually they give you a note. But he comes to him, Rabbi, it's one o'clock already. You're already speaking four hours. It was supposed to be an hour and a half. He said, what do you want from me? You brought me my wife's teeth. <laughs> <laughs> this joke has a little tooth in it. Because I saw in many of the books of Shlom Bayit that one of the things the husband has to have for his wife is a lot of patience. Because she has to talk. Now, if she wants to talk now, it has to be now, not another 10 minutes. Sometimes the husband says, okay, I'll talk to you two hours, but give me 15 minutes to finish what I do. He doesn't understand that it must be now. If not, an atomic bomb will fall in this neighborhood. It has to be now. And when she calls now, it has to be now. Don't ever hang, press ignore. It's a very big crime when your wife calls to press ignore. Very, very, now you may say, but, but I'm in a business meeting. If Obama would call you, you tell the guy, oh, look, Obama is calling me. Give me five minutes. The guy wouldn't get angry. No. So your wife is more important than Obama, no? Right or wrong? Ah, but you got used to her. If you live with Obama 20 years, 
you know, <laughs> you, you, you live together in a dorm, you wouldn't feel his Obama. He's your buddy from school, no? You know what's the difference between a married guy to a single guy? You have to know when I'm saying something serious and when I'm saying a joke. Not always you know which one is serious, which one is a joke. Not always. Now you see, if, you tell me if it's a joke or real, what I'm, what I'm about to say. A single guy, you see, okay, let me first make an introduction, not to offend anyone. The marriage situation today in the world is, is horrible. It's, most of the marriages are not healthy. A lot of problems, lots of abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, disrespect, many, many cases of divorce. So the statistic is obvious. You cannot argue with the number. And one of the reasons that the marriages are not working well is people have a very low spiritual level. In the old days, a person married a woman for the mitzvah. Pretty, not pretty, it's not so important. As long as she's not King Kong, everything else is fine. You know, she doesn't have to be very pretty. She's a, she has a, an okay look. I'm very happy, 100%. Don't, look too long, don't have to look around. No, I don't have anybody to compare her to. I'm a mother's person. I'm satisfied with what I have and finished. That, that's, the, that's how it used to be. Today, people are in a very low level. One reason, because they don't learn Torah. Almost nobody learns Torah. And that's, uh, if you have an infection and you don't take your antibiotic, it's only growing. Second reason, besides not taking your antibiotic, which is your daily Torah morning and evening, second, you have so much cancer around you, you cannot avoid it. You walk in the street. Let's see if you walk in Manhattan. Every step is a sin. You walk like this, JVC, Sony, this. That, that model, that, that fake guy, that one, this one, on the radio, in a sub, everywhere you go, it's a scene. Around the clock, in business, meeting. It's not what it used to be, a clean world, people cover, they come, business is business. It's a different world. So today, the Torah is more crucial than before. Since people always see all kinds of pictures, they bring you the most beautiful people to their face all the time, it's, it's, it's ruining the marriage. From both sides, not only from the men's side. So now comes, now comes the story. What's the difference between a single guy to a married guy? A single guy come home, he check what's in the fridge, and he goes to bed disappointed. That's what single guys, they only eat out. He comes, he opens the fridge, of course nothing there, maybe half a lemon, two pieces of garlic. He goes to bed disappointed. A married person comes home, he gets to his bedroom, he sees what's in his bedroom, he gets disappointment, he runs to the fridge. <laughs> you understand? That's a sad joke. As soon as he comes home, his wife begins to attack. All day you didn't answer my call. He gets so depressed. He looks for, maybe in the garbage, maybe there's a little bit of left. Let me relax myself. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> so let me just conclude what I started to say about the Chafetz Chaim. Listen good. It says, My children, this is what he said to the rabbis who came. Kol all the time of our exile, which is in his time was 1900 years of exile. Today it's 2000 years. We are living, we are alive. Listen word by word. We are alive thanks to the speeches, the drashot of the Rishonim, of our sages about hell and heaven. From the time those lectures stopped and the speakers do not speak about it anymore, the life of the soul of the nation of Israel finished. No more life to the Jewish soul. This is talking about the soul of the entire nation of Israel. And the modern, the modern lectures, the modern lectures, not only do not help, 
מזיקות לשומעים, making damages to the listeners. Why? They make them feel good about themselves. So I answer those people who tell me I'm afraid to turn them off. To turn a person off, he has to be a little bit on first. Once he's on, you can turn him off. If he's off all his life, to turn off, off? What's to turn off? What's to turn off? You ask him, who is Avraham Avinu? He doesn't know. Who is Noah? He doesn't know. What is it Shabbat? He doesn't know. Nothing in his life he doesn't know. You worry to turn him off? What? How more off he can be? He's about to marry Christine tomorrow. How more off are you going to turn him off? So he's going to stop kissing the mezuzah once a year? That's what you worry about? You have an opportunity to take a Jew and shake him up? If it works, you just saved him in one lecture. If not, no. What did you lose? He get angry at you that you told him the truth. One month he doesn't want to hear anything about Judaism, and then he forgets. And he move on with his life. Tomorrow you have another opportunity. What, why do you worry so much? This is the way we have to talk. This is how we have to, we have to tell people the situation. Otherwise, and don't forget that it costs millions of dollars. All these phony Kiruv act, act, activity, it costs millions of dollars. People are paying for it. An investor give a million dollars a year to some kind of organization to make Baalei Tshuva, and in the end he find they'd made 20 Baalei Tshuva the entire year with his million dollars. When he comes to heaven, he'll be very upset. He promised me the world. That's what you really did? 20 Shomrei Shabbat with my million dollars? It's also responsibility. It's deceiving people. It's deceiving people. You tell them one story, they give you money, and in the end, you're very far away from what you promise. You understand what's going on here? So the Chafetz Chaim continue, and he says like this, And who knows? Ah. And Kvar Nishkach Esha Geenom. Chafetz Chaim said today, Nobody remembers the punishment of hell. People forgot already. And heaven, what's happening in heaven and hell. And because of that, all the tragedies are coming to the nation of Israel. And who knows what's going to be the end of all this. Word by word. And the Chafetz Chaim begged them to start again. To teach the public that life is not a picnic. Picnic is my word. But you got the point. That's what he say. To teach them there is reward and punishment and there is a price to pay or to receive. You can also earn, not only lose. But if you don't know that you are either earning or losing, how are you going to be a tzaddik? David Amelech. You know anyone more legendary than him, King David? What does he write in Tehilim? Shamarti Toratecha, I observed your Torah, your mitzvot, for the reward who you put away for your followers. David Amelech is not embarrassed to say, you know why I'm keeping mitzvot Hashem? One of the reasons, of course, he has many other reasons, a holy person. He's not embarrassed to say, you know why I keep it? Because I know that you are faithful as you promised to pay a huge reward for your followers. It gives me energy, motivation. What's bad about it? It's a crime? You come to work, you work 10 hours, they kill you. You come to ask for your $100, dollars you a criminal? No, you deserve it, no? If you don't do anything, no, then you understand why you don't want to take the money. You're embarrassed. All day you said read newspaper and you didn't work and now you come to your boss, give me 200 bucks. But most likely next week you won't work there. But if you work very hard, you're embarrassed to ask for your salary? You're a thief. What's the problem? If a person fights against his evil inclination, he's against his yetzer hara and to keep mitzvot. Why is, not, why is not allowed to say, you know, Hashem, I'm waiting for your reward that you promise. King Solomon, you heard about him? You heard about him, right? Besides that he wrote a conclusion of his life as one of the most successful people financially, physically, spiritually, and this is what he, how he concludes his life. And this is a will for us, his children. Sof davar akol nishma. In the end, everything will be heard. Et elokim yera. No, first he say like this. Hevel avalim akol hevel. I'm telling you from experience. 
from knowing all the secrets of the world, of the creation. Here is what I have to tell you. Everything is nonsense. Houses, cars, every two weeks vacation, what watch we're going to put for the wedding, what kind of flowers, who's going to come, where we're going to make them sit in a wedding, what band, we need another band, and another, I don't know, $100,000 for the food, and another special caterer from Italy, bring him in first class, that nobody would say that the wedding wasn't fancy enough. Uh, all this nonsense, you know what I'm talking about. All this fake lifestyle that slowly, slowly entered the religious world more and more by the minute and destroying every territory. We used to laugh at these people who live like this. Every second religious guy today is more fancy than the secular people in his lifestyle. He worries about what car is driving every day more than the secular guy from the neighborhood. He's worried about his watch, he's worried about his designer clothes, He's worried about all this nonsense, more than the goyim, more, sometimes more than the goyim. You bring him a nice tie, but it's not a brand name, he won't put it. If you don't believe me, I'll take you to these phony religious people to show you how they live. Then you understand what I'm talking about. Yes, and this is exactly what the Torah warned from. The whole concept of Judaism is not to be addicted to phony temporary life to remind us that this is only a ticket to life of eternity. And we want to be here forever, forever. So King Solomon wrote, Sof davar akol nishma, everything will be heard, et ha'elokim yera, ve'et mitzvotav shmor, ki ze kol adam. Fear God, keep his commandments, because that's what a human being is all about. Nothing else. Nothing else. Not your college degree, not how beautiful your eyes are, nothing else. Nothing else you can impress Hashem with. What a good basketball player you are. What a good athlete you are. What a great boxer you are. I don't know all this nonsense that people... One guy sent me a, in a Facebook, you know, there's thousands of people in a Facebook. Everything bad in life, you can use it to do something good. Internet to begin with is poison. If you use it for website, for Torah teaching, no, one good thing came out of it. You can save souls. Facebook, the same idea. Since people don't have patience to sit more than 10 minutes in our days, because their head is so contaminated with all the garbage that they see and hear every day, I don't know one person that has patience to read a book today, to start it and finish it. They do it in 5,000 installments, half a page every day. By the time he goes to the second chapter, he doesn't remember the name of the actor in a, in a story. Why? They can't focus. In the lecture, after 10, 15 minutes, you see the people move to the edge of the chair and they hold their knees like this, getting ready to jump. Then they pretend they need a bathroom and they run. Why? They cannot focus more than 10, 15 minutes. So what, what's the solution? No. Short clips on the Facebook. Short clips, 10 minutes, my friend, don't worry. Hashem saw the level of the people, so he invented something that called YouTube. No, you cannot put more than 10 minutes. Why? If it would be full movies, <laughs> anybody, nobody listens. And I tell the guy, here, come, DVD, four hours. Soon as here, four hours, I'm afraid already to say four hours. And I said, don't worry, it's three different parts. No, no, still, it's too much. I won't watch it. Why are you giving it to me? It's a shame to lose a dollar. <laughs> he said, Why? Oh, four hours of words of Torah? Ooh, what? You don't have a better punishment for me? Amesir ozno mishmoa Torah gam tfilato to'eva. You heard that? Someone who doesn't have patience for the Torah of Hashem, when he prays, his prayers is despicable in the eyes of God. Measure for measure. You are not attracted to my Torah? You're not crazy about my Torah? You listen to Torah and you get up and you go out? And now you come to pray to me, to praise me? For what are you praising me? The only reason you praise me is because I gave you the Torah. Otherwise, what better in you than all the other Gentiles? You come to me as my son. How you became my son? You received a gift from me. But you say, no, no, I'm not interested in your gift. Put it in the garbage. Just listen to my request, Hashem. Okay, today, this is what I need. <laughs> and he expects that Hashem will send him FedEx, same-day delivery. 
one hour delay, I'm not religious anymore. That's it. Why? All, everything I request, it doesn't come right away. Sometimes it takes a week, Rabbi. Here, I'm, I'm 20 years old and I'm not married already. You know what's going on here? This is the mind of a person. If Hashem will make the earth quit, Rabbi, I'll become religious. Now, how many times I heard that nonsense? So Hashem's going to ruin the entire city of Elat now, because one Israeli guy considering to keep Shabbat. No, so buildings will fall, restaurants will collapse. Why? He wants, he wants to see a proof that Hashem listens. All these things that you hear. So Shlomo HaMelech wrote, Et HaElokim Yera, fear God, and keep his mitzvot, because this is what a person is all about, nothing else. And in another place, what did he write? Ashrei Adam mefached tamid. Ashrei Adam. How lucky is a person who went to Harvard University? Didn't you see in Kohelet he wrote it? No. <laughs> what did he write, Shlomo HaMelech? Ashrei Adam that fear God all the time. That's a lucky person. Rabbi, too much, too much. We can't take this. It's fanatic. Why, why have to talk about this? Say how beautiful it is. The Torah wrote the number of the stars. The Torah knew about every fish that has scales. That it, cannot, you know, it must have fins. Say about you know, the codes in the Torah. That's, for instance, very interesting. Say about the red cow. Say about marriage, how beautiful. Say about lighting candles and singing and bring the guitar and Motzei Shabbos and sing around the fire. This is it. You know, eating chulent, being 500 pounds. You know, this is what we like. You know, Pesach in Miami Beach, together with Chris and Christine around the table in a, in a, in a hotel, in a lobby. This is what we like. What are you bringing us this? Mechal el Shabbos. We don't, we're not interested in this. We're not going to come anymore. Okay, so I have a question to ask the people who speak. Why Hashem wrote half of the Torah warnings and punishment? If he didn't want anyone to hear it, what's the, what's the point of writing it? You see that that's what he wanted us to hear. And why did Hashem give so many punishments in the Torah? Why? Yes. Don't we say Hashem is Rahman, is merciful? Merciful doesn't go usually with so many punishments. Why did he give so many punishments? Chalel Shabbat, horrible punishment. Stealing, you pay double. Cheating, oh, execution. This, kare, this, that. Well, what's going on here? It's mentioned let, let, let Hashem not punish anyone. The answer to it is, if the righteous person who follow the Torah and overcome all his desires and all his test in life and was a believer and was following Hashem and helping the poor and doing chesed and giving out money that he worked very hard for to help other people, keeping Shabbat, closing in store on Shabbat, praying three times a day, and a person who was a rapist, a liar, a cheater, a mechal el Shabbat, an abuser, and, and a million other things, will have the same end? Where is the justice of God? He wrote about himself, I am the God of the justice. Thank you very much. I'm not interested in this justice. The righteous Jew and the wicked Jew will have the same end? No punishment? So what's the point? No reward, no punishment? Everyone the same, he same end? Hitler and Rav Ovadia Yosef will be in the same place in heaven? That's what you want the Torah to be? So now, why people get upset? Because they don't believe that to be Mechalel Shabbat is an ethical problem. No big deal. You're making too much of it, Rabbi. It's not such a big deal. I drive on Shabbat. I smoke on Shabbat. After all, I'm not a murderer. Before you say that foolish statement, did you ever check in the eyes of God which one is the worst sin or no? First, learn Torah. See what's God's opinions about the mitzvot, which mitzvah is higher than the other, which sin is worse than the other, then make your statement. I won't be surprised if you tell me, Rabbi, listen, I'm keeping Shabbat strictly 100%, but I don't give 10% of my income, I only give 9%. 
After all, a person that gives 9% tzedakah instead of 10 is not the same criminal like someone who is violating Shabbat. Everybody understands that. There's nothing to compare. This is a major, major criminal. And this is a person who doesn't keep the rule 100%. No, he loses. The more you give, the more you earn. That's besides the point. But Michalel Shabbos has no share to the world to come. There's nothing to talk about. The moment he dies, all the gates of heaven are permanently closed for him. He can never see it, ever. Horrible thing. So now he comes and says, Ah, worse punishment than Michalel Shabbat than a murderer? Come on, you're crazy. What kind of Torah is this? So the answer is, who is in charge of life, of the Torah, of the rules? Who? The one who made it. The manufacturer, right? When you have a problem with the sensor in your Honda, you go to the mechanic in Gaza that doesn't hardly know how to open a screw, or you go to the Honda dealer that knows right away where the sensor, what the problem is. Some, to change brakes, everybody knows. To change the tire, everybody knows. But, you know, complicated problems in a car, you gotta go to the dealer, there's no other way sometimes. You wanna know which thing is worse? You have to check what Hashem's opinion. How do you know? One way to know is based on the punishment. You don't get the same punishment for wa not washing your hands when you eat bread and when you murder the person. If the punishment of, be of not washing the hands would be equal to a murderer, it would be a very, very confused place. However, when you see a murderer and a Michal el Shabbos, then a Michal el Shabbos has a much worse punishment than a murderer. What is the conclusion? What? You tell me. That who does Hashem upset it more? At the murderer or at the Michal el Shabbos? The Michal el Shabbos. So why people don't feel any guilt feelings when they get into the car and drive? Or when they go to the business as usual? Or when they're on the phone or watch television? Because they grew up like this. They got used to it. If you grew up in an island with all these zombies that walk naked like this with their swords, and every second somebody kills somebody and there's no police, no court, and the stronger one control, you would become a monster. And you won't feel that anything is bad. Oh, you just killed someone that you like his girlfriend. Nobody say anything. Oh, I say Mazal Tov for your new girlfriend. <laughs> Why? Everyone does it every minute. Shh, shh, shh. All day like this. The world used to be like this in some places. You're strong. You survive, like in, a, like in a jungle. Who survived in a jungle? The laws of the jungle, before the Torah was given. Ah, so if you grow up with murderers, a murderer will be your guest for Shabbos. No problem. If your son will bring a son of a mafia murderer to your house for Shabbat, to stay with him, from his school. You send your son to public school, let's say your family is Shomer Shabbos, you broke, you don't have money for yeshiva, you have money for 15 televisions in the house and, for, and three vacations a year. When it comes to yeshiva, somehow business is bad. So fine, you send your kids to public school. No, now on his left, Chris sitting, on the other right, Mr. Lee sitting, behind Christine, and in front, Muhammad. So this is his gang. So now he, every week he wants to bring another friend. to the, This Shabbat, Muhammad, next Shabbat, Bruce Lee. <laughs> every week he has a new friend. Now... He brought a Jewish friend. Jewish friend. Nice hair, five earrings, you know, <laughs> no problem. So the boy comes, the boy comes, and he asks him what your father is doing. He said, my father has a store. He's open seven days a week. He's in a store every day. He works seven days a week. Halal Shabbat. Do you feel like throwing this kid out of your house? No. What's the problem? You're feeding him, you give him all the attention. But if your son will bring next Shabbat a son of a mafia murderer that is on the television, a hit guy, killing people. Who is this guy? What's his last name? Gadi. <laughs> Michel Gadi. Gadi, you related to Gadi, the, 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 the deceased mafia guy? Yeah, he is my father. What would happen that minute? Right the way you take your son to the room, you're normal, you're crazy, this is the way I brought you up, what are you doing to us, you want us to, you want everyone to talk about us, so what's the problem Abba, what, what's, he's the nicest guy in the world this guy, 
You know what a sweetheart? You know how much he helps people in the class? You know how smart he, you know how he learns? Everybody likes him. Get out of here. Make sure he doesn't ever come here. Wow, what's the problem? His father is a murderer. The boy is innocent. His father is a murderer. You cannot see him in your house. Ah, because a murder, everybody at least still understands that it's a horrible crime. But to be Mechalel Shabbat, they got used to it. Ah, we grew up like this. In Israel, in Russia, in here, in there. Everyone was driving to work, Rabbi. Everyone was driving to Shul. So I have news to you. In Yemen, 2,600 years, you didn't have one Yemenite Jew that was ever Mechalel Shabbat until this second. Not one secular Jew in the history of Yemen. Did you ever hear that? If you don't believe me, come tomorrow to Mansi. I take you to the Yemenite Jews. They only came from Yemen 10 years ago. They still dress like Yemenite from Yemen. They speak with that accent. They even dress like this. You ask them. They say, even if a Jew would think to do such a thing, he would never dare. It's, not, it's out of the question, Bechlal. Not even it's open for a debate. It's impossible. Why? You know why? Why in Yemen everyone was religious in all the other countries we started to have more and more Mechalelei Shabbat? What caused that? The modern lifestyle is the number one poison. Take television out of our homes. Take all the electrical device, electronic device. Take internet away. Take all these nightclubs and this and, you know, all these fancy schmancy things. What else do you all have in life besides sitting and learning and enjoying the Torah? Ah, when you open thousands of windows, of course, uh, the Yetzirah is choking you. The evil inclination took away your life. The more modern the country is, the situation of their religion in that country is worse and worse. Check. Check. Here, Yaman, everyone Shomer Shabbat. Syria. Syria. Just ten years ago, seven, eight years ago, the Syrians from Syria came to Brooklyn. All of them were Shomer Shabbat. You have 150 Syrian Jews in Syria. All of them go to shul every day. I saw a movie about them. They make a movie about them. Who pays to maintain the shuls in Syria? One of the biggest enemies of Israel, Assad, the president, the supporter of Hezbollah, the supporter of the Hamas, the supporter of every terrorism group. The biggest threat to Israel, perhaps, besides the other lunatic from Iran, one of the most dangerous people to Iran, he pays for the shul. Why? He pays for the maintenance of the cemetery. Why? Politics. You know why? I'll tell you why. I'll give you two answers. The spiritual answer and the physical answer. In the material world, it's all politic. They want to show the world that they're not anti-Semite. They have nothing against Jews. They only have problems with the Zionist country. You understand? That they occupy the Palestinian territories, etc., etc. That's why Ahmadi built a shul for the Jews in Iran and gave them all kinds of money and they brought television and they published it all over the world. That's why he accept the biggest traders in Jewish history, the Neturei Karta, that goes to hug him and they receive very, very fat checks from him. And from Yasser Arafat, they found in his office after he died, the Israeli security service, they found checks, copy checks, cancel checks that he used to give them. Why? They are the best ambassador for him. Hasidic people like this on all over the world. When he died, they went to Paris to pray. Before he died, they stand by the hospital and they read Tehillim for this despicable murderer. That's what money does to a person. You understand what money does to you? You don't see the truth anymore. You want even, you cannot see. That's what the Torah says. Bribe, blind the person, the bribe. It's not that you know that you're doing something wrong because of the money it pays to do. No. You begin to see the thing the opposite of the truth. So if someone will connect you to a lie detector, you will swear on your children's life that that was the right thing to do. And what made you swear? The bribe that you receive. Even bribe after the act, you're not allowed to receive. Let's say you are a judge. You judge fairly a case that came to you. You made the right judgment, 100%, according to the Torah. 
Two months later, the person who won the case wants to send you a donation to your yeshiva. You're not allowed to accept. Why? It's called later bribe. What's bribed about it? He doesn't need anything from me anymore. He won the case already. If the judges know that they are permitted to take later bribe gifts after, automatically they will always rule to the rich people. From the poor people, I won't get donation. Only from the rich people. I might as well make sure that all the rich people win. When there's a 50-50 case, always the rich guy win. Why? Maybe a $5,000 check tomorrow or next month. What am I going to get from this guy? What is he going to send me? Ah, now when there's no permission to take it, it's against the Torah. No, so that's another guard to save you from, from not doing the right thing. So that's one reason. Polit politics, they want to show the world we're not racist. What's the real reason? Every place in the history that the Jews kept the Torah and the Shabbat and they have synagogues and yeshivot, they respect the Torah and they live according to the rules of God, the Goim did not touch them ever. Check. All the countries that suffered the horrible punishments of the Nazis. Oh. All of them were all Europeans except two. Two Sephardic countries were affected. Greece and Libya, where the Italians were in charge. Because the Jews in Libya started to become like the Italians. Started to speak Italian, French. In those areas, 60,000 of them died. In Greece, 80,000 Greek Jews died. Any other country, the Nazis has planned. To Syria, to Iraq, to Iran, to Israel. Everywhere. There was the plan. The plan was already ready. Another week or two. They collapsed. No Egypt. They couldn't enter. But Why? Because... Ev Poland, they were very I have news for you. Not so much. Not so much. Yeah. The intermarriage already became a situation that 80% of the Jews in Europe overall, mainly in Germany and other places, but overall, started to be like the Goim, like the Jews in America today. You have Jews in America, they hardly know... What does it mean to be a Jew? I'll tell you a story that happened two weeks ago. You know the person, probably. You know Moshe Mertizada, the Persian guy? Moshe, the Persian guy? You know him, right? Who knows him? You have to know him. Is that the one that the post all over Brooklyn? No, he's, he lives here in, in Queens, next, not far from Queens Boulevard. He's in Bet Gavriel almost every night. He's teaching there. He has a beard, glasses, Persian. Very nice guy. Very nice tzaddik. Mamash, you know... As, as it should be. So him, you know, he, he teach Torah to young guys. They come there in the evening. If you ever go to Bet Gavriel at 8, 8.30, you'll see him there. Now I'm telling you his name, because if I don't tell you the stories with names, you always may have a suspicion that I make it more beautiful than what it is. So I got to tell you the names that you can go tomorrow and call him. If you want his number, I'll give you even his cell number. You can check tonight with his name. Two... Two to two and a half weeks ago, I get a phone call. I was driving already on my way to Queens around three, four in the afternoon. I get a phone call. Ashkenazi accent. You see right away a religious guy. It turns in the end, I found out it was a Chabadnik from Brooklyn. He calls me up. He said, you know a person by name, um, um, uh, Zaza, he doesn't know how to say his name. Until it took me a few times to realize I heard the word Zadeh. I say, is it by any chance Moshe Mertizadeh? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, Moshe Mertizadeh. I say, yeah, yeah, sure I know him. What's the problem? He said, we found his wallet now. One guy found his wallet here, and he gives, he gives it to me now. The other guy wasn't religious. He gives it to me if I can return the wallet to this guy. We don't know his number, but we found your card inside his wallet. So we want to see if you know him. Maybe you can give us his telephone number. So I gave him his telephone number, his cell phone number, and the house number. And that was the end of it. I gave him the number. Baruch Hashem, they contacted him. Yesterday, accidentally, his number was dialed from his phone to my, when I was giving the lecture last night. I see he left a message. When I listened to my messages, I see he left the, the line open for 20 minutes. Because it dialed automatically. It happens a lot today. Redial automatically, he dialed something, up, 
the phone. So I called him up last night, 11 o'clock, something like this. And Moshe, you call and you don't hang up. He said, oh, I didn't even know I called. It's accidentally. Okay. By the way, whatever happened with your wallet, you got it? He said, yeah, yeah, I got it. You're not going to believe what a miracle happened with his wallet. I said, what happened? He said, the guy who found it was an Italian, half Italian, half Jew. His mother is Jewish. His father is an Italian guy. I always explain to the people, there's no half Jew. There is one case that you can be half Jewish, half Goy. There is one case. And I promise you, if I give you a hundred years, you won't come up with the answer. But I'll tell you the answer by just when I finish the story. How can you be half Jew, half Goy? But all the other cases, it goes by your mother. If your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. Your father is, uh, Jew- is Jewish. It's not necessarily means you're Jewish. It goes by the mother. In that case, this guy was lucky. The Jewish side is his mother, so he's Jewish. But he has no idea what Judaism is. But he's a decent person. He found a wallet. He wants to return. So he didn't know how to find that, that this guy. He's seen a driver's license, a guy with a peot, beard. He knows right away he's a religious Jew. What this, what this a clever guy does, he looks for somebody that looks like it. Beard, peot. Oh, he caught one Chabadnik on the street. As the Chabadnik trying to locate him by calling me, the Chabadnik asked him, tell me, are you a Jew? He said, half. My mother is Jewish. So the Chabadnik said, what do you mean half? So you're a Jew. Did you put filin today? <laughs> See, the guy is no yarmulke, no nothing. The guy said, what is it, filin? He doesn't know what filin is. He said, you know this, he's showing filin. I don't know what it is. Guy, bar mitzvah, nothing. Grew up like Italian. He said, come, come, I'll show you. It's mitzvah, this. He puts filin on him. First time in his life he put filin, this guy. So he puts filin. And now the guy... You know, contact Moshe and return him the wallet. Few hours after Moshe received the wallet, he gets a phone call from that Jew with the Goy father. He calls him up. He says, Moshe, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. A miracle. (laughs) A miracle? What happened? I lost my wallet for a long, long time. I looked everywhere for it and I couldn't find it. One hour after I handed your wallet, I found my wallet. Why did Hashem make this miracle to this Jew who grew up like a goy? Clear miracle, obviously. Months you don't find your wallet. An hour after you found someone's wallet, you all of a sudden find your wallet. To give him a real push. Wake up, my friend. Your time has come. Everyone has his opportunities in life. You did. I tested you. Like Avram Avinu. What do you think? I came to Avram Avinu. Avram, come, I love you. No. One test, two tests, three tests, four, five, six. Ten major tests. Then I say, I put my seal on you. You're 100% tzaddik. I know you're going to teach my Torah to your children. You are my messenger in this world. Nasi Elohim ata bekurbenu, the Goim told him. You are the representative of God. Why? You see right away how God loves you, you know. So what happened? Only after Abraham proved himself, Hashem gave him the gift to be religious. What do you think? To be religious, you take it for granted? You have to dance on the street from happiness that I have the opportunity to know what Shabbat is, what Filin is, what, what to eat kosher, what to say bracha to Hashem. Just the reward for one bracha, you eat one bite from an apple, is more than his entire world. Take gates, and Buffett and all the other trillionaires put them all together, multiply all the generation from the, the beginning of the world until now, it won't be the reward of one bracha on an apple. And it's not an exaggeration, it's clearly in a Torah. All the reward of all people in this world, physical world, will not be equal to one hour in heaven of the reward of a righteous Jew. And what people are losing from their ignorance and not only they losing, they fight against the religion from their ignorance, not knowing what it means. So this guy got to put filin for the first time of his life. What does Hashem expect from him? You go and check what Judaism is all about. So I told Moshe, well, you left him alone? Why didn't you give him my website, the film, to watch, to open up his eyes? 
You never know. And a week from now, he's going to already come and say, I want to I really be a Jew. You don't know. Maybe he's one of these guys that right away, in one second, would run after the Torah. And in a year from now, you see him already religious and keeping Shabbos. You see already Hashem started something with him. You know, Rav Aaron Kotler was the founder of Yeshiva Lakewood. One time they escaped from Europe across the border overnight. There's a guy who showed them the way, the mountains. They escaped because the Nazis are already coming. So they have to escape. So they escaped. In the middle of, after an hour that they ran, he remember he forgot his tefillin. So he told the guy, I'm very sorry, I have to go back to get my tefillin. So the guy told him, I don't know what it is, but believe me, there's no time. If it's a life risk, go. Otherwise, there's no return, because we're not waiting for you. We have to run. Soon it's going to be sunrise. So he said to him, I'm very sorry. I'm not expecting you to wait for me. You continue, and I'll find you, Bezrat Hashem. Go. He ran back. He got his tefillin. Now it's a sunrise already. Morning. You cannot go in the morning. There's a lot of soldiers. So he, he, wa he wanted to find a place to hide. So he saw a farm, a quiet area. He comes to the farm, he says to, to the guy, do you mind that I'm going to be in the barn or in the, in the back until the evening, once it gets dark, I have to continue to go? So he said to the, the guy, looked at him, he saw he's not a threat, you know, he saw him, so okay, go sit there. Well, he brought him something to drink. When the guy came, he saw him with his feeling on, <laughs> sitting and learning, and he has his feeling on. So the guy, the owner of the farm, if, he froze. He looks at him, he said he say to him, are you a Jew? Rav Aaron Kotler asked him. So the guy said, my mother is Jewish, but, you know, I'm not, uh, have you ever put filin in your life? You're a Jew. He told him, never. He said, come, come, once in your life you should put it at least. So he put filin on him. He showed him what to read, this, he helped him. He did the mitzvah. In the evening, he said goodbye, and he left, and he got saved. Then he came to America and opened the second largest yeshiva in the world, in Lakewood. Three, four thousand people there, learning around the clock. So, after a few years, he comes to his son one day, Rav Schneor Kotler. Today it's Rav Malkiel Kotler, the grandson. He comes to his son, and he said, this night I had a fascinating dream. So what? He said many years ago, he now is telling him how he escaped. I found the owner of the farm and I put a feeling on him. Tonight he came to me in a dream and he said, I'm not alive anymore. I want you to know that 10 minutes that I put the feeling on, thanks to you, changed my entire trial. You have no idea how much it saved me. Why? Why? A big deal he puts feeling once in his life. For him, that was the major test of his life. Because until now, it was like he go 100%. He didn't know what to live for, what is religion, nothing. You saw, he didn't see tefillin in his life. He could have said to Rav Aaron Kotler, no, no, please leave me alone. I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in this. It's not for me. You do it. Let me go back to my work. That would be the test. Do it or don't. If you did it, now who knows, Hashem puts you back in a new reincarnation, in a different body, in a different place. He gives you such a better life with religion, with good parents, with good rabbis, with good yeshiva. Everything, thanks to one thing that you did in your previous life, you get another chance now, another 70 years chance. You didn't do once, twice, three, four times, four chances in your life. You neglected them, you ignored them. Hashem said, that's it. You, now you come and say, but it's not fair. I wasn't born religious. I didn't grow up religious. I grew up with Goim. Hashem will show you those four chances that you have. See? This guy was begging you. You didn't want. You see, this guy was stuck 2 o'clock at night. You saw a Jew. You knew you were a Jew. You don't know what a Jew means. You saw a Jew is stuck in a highway, begging with cables, freezing, whatever. If two minutes you would stop giving cables. That's all I expected from you. For that, you don't need to be religious. It's a matter of decency. You, you miss that opportunity. Another time someone gave you a CD. One month it was in your car until it went to the garbage. You have a CD about God and you're not curious to see what, it's, what does it have to offer? They put it in your hand and you're not putting in just out of curiosity. Even if a Muslim guy will give me a CD about some kind of things that they teach in a mosque, 
out of curiosity, the first 10, 20 seconds, I would want to see what they say over there. What do they teach? Maybe they're repeating some of the Gemara from the Torah. One time I went into the Hamas website. They copy pages from the Torah. Avraham met Sarah, Avraham righteous, Sarah, she's a prophet. The whole story. Copy from Torah. Avraham, peace be on him. Yitzchak, peace be on him. David Amelech, peace be on him. In the Hamas. They copy parts from the Torah. It gives you an idea what they teach over there. It gives you an idea what the Christian believes in. No, don't get me wrong. We are not allowed to sit and learn their nonsense. It's a waste of time, 100%. It's not even permitted. But finally, out of curiosity, how can a person see something that somebody gave him and not be curious at least for 10 seconds? Oh, you hear Avodah Zarah, you hear something against God, throw it to the garbage. But how do you know? Maybe over there they teach about, you know, things that is positive, love God, this. Something! A person like called his eyes. Time is running out, so we finish, basically, maybe one last thing to tell you for tonight. How a person can be half Jew and half a Goy. How? In the old days, people used to be slaves. Now, what's the rule? The rule, if Evet Knaani from the, country, from the nation called Knaan is a Goy, Goyim. This is one of the seven nations that Hashem said not to have mercy on them. They kicked them out of the land when the Jews came and entered Israel after they came out of Egypt. So what's the halacha? If you buy a goy slave in a market, he offers himself to be a slave. He, doesn't have, he cannot make a living. He comes to the market. He says, you know, I want to sell myself. I want to have a good master. He feeds me, takes care of me, and I work for him. It used to be very popular in those days. Jews also used to be slaves if there were thieves. If a thief stole money and now he doesn't have to return, they don't send him home that he can make a new bankruptcy tomorrow and cheat somebody else. You don't have to pay? Let's see what you own. We'll sell it and we pay what you owe. Oh, you don't, have, you don't own anything? You wasted the money you stole? We're selling you in the market as a slave. The money goes to the person that you owe him money. And you work seven years, you'll be a slave. That's how it used to be. Not like today, you call up the lawyer, oh, give me $1,500, I clean your credit. America, it's a school for crooks. Call now, the laws of bankruptcies are about to change. Before it's going to be too late, you know. So anyway, now he's Evet Knani. As soon as a Jew buys him, he converts him right away. Circumcision, he goes into the mikveh, tovel, it's called Tvila Leshem Avdut. Tvila, dipping in the water, for the purpose of being a slave, which includes in it a conversion. Why? He gets the status of a woman. He has to keep all the mitzvot like a woman. Even though he's a man, he keeps mitzvot like a woman. He's not obligated to learn Torah because his time is not his, it belongs to his master. He doesn't have to put fill in. He doesn't have to pray three times a day. But he, he has to eat kosher. He has to keep Shabbat. All the laws that applies to a woman goes on him as well. Now what happens if he has two owners, 50-50? Reuven owns 50% of him, and Shimon owns 50% of him. See, now, right now, as we said, he's like a woman. What age a woman is obligated to keep mitzvot? Age 12. She has bat mitzvah. Reuven released him. He said, no, you're not my slave anymore. I'm giving you your freedom for free. So he's half released. He's half ben chorin. Half released, regular man. Half slave. 50, in, his, in his deed, it's 50% mortgage to Shimon, because he did not release him. 50% free, debt free. The 50%... The 50% of him, oh, no, no, one mistake I made. Now we are talking about the guy that refused to go into the mikveh. When he came to be a slave, he didn't want to be a, a Jew. He doesn't want to go into a mikveh, no, not for avdut, not for gerut. So he stayed a guy. This is a regular guy. If Reuven released him, and now he converted, I'm describing to you a very rare situation. How a person can be half Jew, half guy. Half Jew, half Goy, really. If Reuven released him now and he converted, 
Half of him became Jewish, half of him is a goy, because half of him is owned by somebody yet. He never released him, so he's still a slave. That half cannot be converting, because he's still a slave. So what happened? He's half kosher Jew, half slave goy. That's his status. Now, it's not according to all opinions. Don't jump on me. Don't go to your rabbi and start telling him the whole story tomorrow. I don't want to get phone calls. Some agree with that, some disagree. It's an argument between the post scheme if you can convert half. Or it has to be fully, full conversion. So it's not le'alacha. But this is just a hypothetically speaking a scenario how really there's a way for a person to be half Jewish, half not. All other cases, if your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. We'll see you next Monday. Thank you very much and good night.